College football is a pretty crazy place, but is it a crazy enough place in 2023 where the SEC, the Southeastern Conference, the big boys down south, all that, could they be left out of the college football playoff on Selection Sunday? I don't know. It's a weird time we're living in. We got signs being stolen. We got Army joining the American Athletic Conference. We got a bunch of things going on in the wild world that is college football. We're glad to have you in here. Welcome into the hard count. This is the People's College Football Show. College football and college football every single day of the year. And we go live three times a week now. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern. We're in here talking ball and only ball, as we always do every single Thursday before launching into the beautiful thing that is a college football Saturday slate. Got to give you our forecast when it comes to the potential of there being an upset this upcoming Saturday. So I got actually a pretty stacked slate for y'all when it comes to the games to keep an eye on when it comes to the upsets. We'll talk about that here in just a second. As I mentioned, the SEC, a lot of scenarios being played out right now. A lot of different things with potential undefeated conference champions. Is there a way the SEC could miss the playoff? Are we ready to talk about that? Also, if they were to miss the playoff, what would the conversations be that would follow that? Because I know we're going to 12 next year. I understand it's a very, very low possibility. Actually, there's a, there's a 0% chance of the SEC missing the playoff when it comes to a 12-team playoff. But what would be the conversation we have after that? I'm excited to talk about it. Big time get for Texas. Ryan Wingo, five-star wide receiver out of St. Louis, Missouri, gave his commitment to the Longhorns yesterday. We talk recruiting on this show as well because it is the lifeblood of college football, so we give you our thoughts on that. As we also do every single Thursday on this show, we are going to give you all our final thoughts for some of the big games coming up on this slate this Saturday. So Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, what's going on with South Carolina A&M? Got some thoughts as, the, uh, as well over there. So a lot to talk about, a lot to jump into. Make sure you're subscribed if you are not already. Make sure you are dialed into this show right now, The Hard Count, whether it's podcast, Spotify, Apple, wherever you consume your content, whether it's YouTube, like I just said, podcast. Uh, if you're a social media buff, if you want to consume our content via Instagram or Twitter, we're on there as well, at JD Paquel is a great place to reach me. If you could like the video as well while you're here, we would appreciate that greatly. We're going to have a great Thursday, biggest Thursday of the week. It is October 26th, 2023, the last one on the face of the earth. So we're going to make it a great one. We're going to do it right now. We're going to jump into it by starting with the upset forecast for week nine of the college football season. If you're new to this show, and we understand a lot of y'all are, so we're glad to have you here. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. But if you're new to this show, the way that we break down this segment is not upset predictions. Because I think there's not a ton of skill in saying, well, hey, this team is a three-touchdown dog. They're going to win this weekend. Like, if you're right on that, you're right on that. But there's a little bit of luck involved there, as we understand, when it comes to picking games. I want to give you a forecast. So if you're planning a picnic and a potential upset would be the rain cloud, do you feel good about still having that picnic? These are the rain clouds we're about to break down right now. The first one has got to be South Carolina going to Texas A&M. South Carolina now 14 and a half point dog going in the college station. Couple of factors to watch in this one. The first being it's Cocktober. All right. This is essentially the grand finale of Cocktober for South Carolina. We know what South Carolina is in October. They're, they're a force to be reckoned with. South Carolina has been known to uh, go on a tear against teams that they're not necessarily supposed to go on a tear against. Just ask Clemson, ask Tennessee from last year. The key to that is the Spencer Rattler heater effect. It could be a thing where Spencer Rattler walks out there on Saturday afternoon and just gets buckets. Like, that could be the difference maker. It's not overly novel analysis. It's pretty simplistic in nature. But we understand that with Spencer Rattler, there's always that potential that he just goes crazy. And with Texas A&M, we've seen now that pass defense has left something to be desired every now and then. We saw Jalen Miller look like a Heisman candidate by nature of what he did in that game in College Station a few weeks ago. So keep an eye on that one. If they don't have the offensive output they need in this game, does Texas A&M, if they're kind of sleepwalking, if they're having trouble getting things going against South Carolina defensively, which would say something about South Carolina's effort defensively by nature of how they've played, uh, South Carolina is going to score points. And if South Carolina scores points, this thing could get very interesting very, very quickly. Another game to look at here, Ohio State at Wisconsin. Now, you, you know me, I, I'm, bought in, I'm bought in on Ohio State to this point. We got to see him in person. I think the defense is elite. I think Marvin Harrison Jr. is arguably the best player in college football. I'm not talking about best non-quarterback, best player in college football. I think he's a very real case for that. 
But when we look at this spot for Ohio State, to be real, y'all, I hate it. I hate this spot because you just had a huge win, emotionally draining win over Penn State at the crib in Columbus. Now you got to go on the road, and there's a lot of factors that play into this game. If you're Wisconsin, who's, again, a 14.5-point dog at home, you have that letdown spot. That's one. Two, you're on the road, like I said. Three, you got the backup quarterback effect in this one. Braden Locke going to be starting for Wisconsin. Tanner Mordecai dinged up the hand. I don't believe he's going in this game. But when it comes to the backup quarterback effect, there's always that potential of kind of the element of surprise because there's some tape on Braden Locke. He's played a few games now, but still, do you really know what he is as a quarterback? You don't have the same sample size that you would if a quarterback had played the entirety of the season to this point. So there's that going for you. And also the Luke Fickle effect. Luke Fickle, his alma mater is Ohio State. Now that doesn't count for any points when you take the field on a Saturday, but I do think that says something about the, uh, maybe the it factor, the effort factor, if you will, from this Wisconsin coaching staff during the week. I'm just saying, a lot of things going into that one would not surprise me if Wisconsin were to push Ohio State just a little bit. If they can run the football up front, they're going to have a chance. And I, I specialize in the, or I want to highlight the running the football part of this conversation because for Wisconsin, one, I think that's probably where they'll lean with Braden Locke being the quarterback in this game. Second part of that, Ohio State gave their all last weekend against Penn State. I mean, elite effort in the trenches. We knew it was line of scrimmage game going into that matchup, but you wonder how much do they have left in the tank emotionally. I still think Ohio State wins this football game, but again, it would not surprise me if Wisconsin made it a little bit of an interesting game in that first half, maybe even early third quarter. I do think Ohio State eventually does pull away. Uh, another letdown spot of sorts. You got Notre Dame welcoming Pitt to town. Pat Narduzzi and co. Now, you look at the record for Pitt. They're 2-5. and five. Not great. Not great, but they're scrappy. Three losses for Pitt have come by single digits. Okay, so they could very easily, I say very easily, they could in a lot of ways have a path to being five and five. Um, all that, or not, not five and five. Yeah, that would be, yeah, that'd be, that'd be five and three, I suppose, at that point, um, or five and two. Trying to do math on air, never a good idea. The bottom line, Pitt, I think, has a lot more in the tank than what they've shown to this point. Huge win for Notre Dame a couple of weeks ago against USC. Now, we saw this from Oklahoma and from Texas and from Washington. I want to highlight Oklahoma and Texas specifically. Have a big game, Oklahoma wins, Texas loses, close game, final drive, whatever. Emotional game for both sides, pretty draining. You would imagine it was draining for Notre Dame as well with that victory over USC. But then they had the bye week. We saw a big letdown from both those schools. Okay, so now we move into this part of the year. We move into this, this next game, rather, for Notre Dame. You wonder if there's any letdown. And if there is, going back to what we saw Pitt do against Louisville, I think they're good enough in some areas of this game to be able to make it interesting. Still like Notre Dame to win. Still think they get it done. Keep those picnic plans. But regardless, going back to uh, what we were saying about Pitt, could very easily, there's, there's a path for them being 5-2 and two instead of 2-5 and five with those three losses by single digits. Now, speaking of Texas, they got BYU coming to town. Talking about coaches and their alma maters with Luke Fickle and Ohio State. Uh, Steve Sarkeesian went to BYU. Go ahead and YouTube the highlights of Steve Sarkeesian throwing the pill around the yard and dude could sling that thing. Now, for BYU, they are 18 and a half point dogs, but there will be no Quinn Ewers in this football game. The early part of this game will be huge. More than likely, Malik Murphy going to be the guy starting for Texas in this football game, according to Bobby Burton of Inside Texas. And I think Malik Murphy is super talented, but there's still that potential for that first start kind of jitters. And with those first start jitters, we've seen this a couple of times from quarterbacks, those first start mistakes. If he does have that first start mistake early in this game, to what degree is that mistake? Is it like a, hey, I missed that read and missed that throw high on a third down, so we had to punt? Or is it, hey, I left that throw inside on the out route and they ran it back for six and now we're down 7-0 trying to play comeback at the house against a BYU team that's fired up and has some momentum right now? Very different scenarios. A lot of what ifs baked into that, but that's what we do whenever we have some uh, some upsets being talked about when it comes to uh, to upset prediction or upset forecast on our Thursday show. Georgia, Florida. Now it's funny that we're talking about this in the upset category because I think a lot of people, with just the nature of this being a rivalry game, you kind of take the logic file and delete that from the hard drive when it comes to a game like this. This is going to be the kitchen sink from Florida. 
We understand that. We're all on the same page here. Austin Armstrong, we talked about it in one of our uh, breakdowns of this game early. It's like the, hey, we're going to risk it for the biscuit defensively is how I would go about it. I think they're going to be aggressive. I don't think they'll try and play Florida straight up. So a lot of pressure then goes on Carson Beck and this offense to be able to diagnose that, sift through that with no, with no Brock Bowers and be able to score points. So what I want to make sure we talk about when it comes to the upset factor in this game, to me, it's all about the first half. Because Georgia, we've seen them have some issues kind of starting slow. Vanderbilt got up 7-0. We've seen them get down to Auburn, saw them get down to South Carolina. Like Georgia, at times, has taken a little bit to get uh, get the fire lit, if you will. For Florida, that plays directly into their hands because I think they'll, one, come out swinging. And two, if Florida can play with a lead in this game and control the tempo in any facet of this game, and have some belief by how they play in the first half, I think things get really interesting. Now, we already made our prediction on Georgia to win that football game, but I'm just saying, keep an eye on the first half of that game. That's going to dictate a lot of what Florida has to do, what you ask Graham Merce to do, and uh, will tell us a lot about where Georgia's at without Brock Bowers at this point in time. Last one I want to talk about, you'll notice kind of a beefy slate here when it comes to the upset forecast. Kind of a beefy slate. Clemson. At NC State, NC State is a 10-point dog at home. One, this is a rivalry. I want to make sure we'll say that. They do not like each other at all. Second, this is a homecoming for NC State. How, how disrespected do you have to feel if you're Clemson and NC State has got you for homecoming? Got to feel some disrespect there. Now, I also want to say this to NC State. They get a whole bye week before this game. So they have had a whole extended period of time now two weeks essentially to prep for Clemson so they'll have it dialed in and I think there's a lot of questions to be asked about Clemson like say what you want about NC State what they do or don't have how they do or don't match up with what Clemson has on that roster like Clemson just got knocked down last week emotional loss against Miami where is Clemson where is Clemson it feels like they are maybe not free falling but they're getting very close to that territory of us like not even recognizing what they are anymore So a win over NC State could kind of stabilize things a little bit if you're Clemson, but I'm just saying that's one that I'm watching. And uh, that 10-point number at home for NC State, curious about that. So a lot to watch this week when it comes to the upset forecast. We told you last week it was kind of a, uh, a slim slate, if you will, to potential upsets. This week I think there's a lot to watch and a lot to be excited about when you're kind of keeping track of that ticker on Saturday afternoon. Appreciate everybody tuned in live, man. Appreciate y'all being doubted. If you could like the video while you're here, a little thumbs up icon under the video, that would be phenomenal. And we would keep this streak alive with 100 likes before we get off the air. So if everyone could like that right now, we would keep a good thing going. Uh, hey, Nick, bless you. Nick was, uh, is off to the right here. and just had a little sneeze. I want to make sure we bless our guy before we move on here. And want to make sure we bless y'all too as we move on. Prize Picks is bringing you the hard count today. And before we get into our prize picks picks for this week, I want to give you all a quick thank you because we heard back from prize picks the other day and they've just said, hey, listen, y'all are crushing it on that front. Shout out to your audience for getting it done. And it's like, man, we knew that already. I mean, this is this is the program. What are you talking about? The people deliver in an elite fashion. Whenever we put out a call to action, whenever we're putting down these entries and y'all have answered in a phenomenal way using our code. So thank you for that. It's a great way to support the show. And we appreciate y'all enormously for that. So code JD. No periods in between there, just code JD. Whenever you sign up, 100% deposit match, up to 100 bucks. Y'all, this is a blast to play. If you want to elevate your viewing experience during a Saturday afternoon, you want to take it to the next level, Prize Picks is a great way to do that. It's daily fantasy, safe, easy to use. It's free, like, it's a great time. So, what we got on the agenda for this week's when it comes to our Prize Picks, got a little flex play for you. Had a flex play last week. It hit. We're going back to the well. So here we go. We like Braylon Allen against Ohio State. They got him at half a rushing touchdown. Listen, y'all know how we feel about this. Good things happening to good people. College kids living their dreams. Braylon Allen scoring a touchdown against Ohio State. His head coach is on the modder. With a backup quarterback, they're going to need him to get in the end zone. Braylon Allen, we like the more there on the half rushing touchdown. Cade Stover, half a receiving touchdown. So same game now. If you're Wisconsin, man, like, did we not see what Marvin Harrison Jr. did to Penn State? Did we not see him just go absolutely berserk in that game? If I'm Wisconsin, what am I going to do? Probably give him double coverage the entirety of the game. So when that happens, 
Less attention on the big boy caged over at tight end to work the middle a little bit. He had a good game last week, too, against Penn State. I'm expecting him to get in the end zone, half a receiving touchdown. Go ahead and give us the more. Now the third one here, Dylan Gabriel. Passing, rushing, receiving, touchdown. His number is two and a half. We're going to take the more. One, because we like to see good things happen to good people. We already said that before. Dylan Gabriel, program guy of the week here on the uh, on the hard count from what he did against red uh, or what he did in red river against texas i think you may need some points against kansas now i think you may need some points jalen daniels at the time of us being live does not sound like he will be the guy for kansas but jason bean now quarterback for kansas loosening the wing up a little bit expect him to throw it around the yard i like the more there again that's two and a half total touchdowns more or less for dylan gabriel so Again, this is a flex play. If you want a power play, it be my guest. That's not what we're doing. If you want to follow us, we're going the flex play. If you get all three of these right, which would be a great day for us, would not be out of the ordinary for us, you would 2.25x your entry. Now, if we don't get all three of these, let's say we miss on one of them. That's okay. That's why you're flexing it, baby. You get two correct, 1.25x your entry. Again, redeem code JD, 100% deposit match, up to 100 bucks. The prize picks, bringing y'all the hard count. We love y'all. They love y'all. Appreciate y'all supporting the show by using that code and for uh, getting the good people involved with prize picks and uh, just, yeah, having a good time on a Saturday. Appreciate y'all for that, man. Seriously, that is a tremendous way to support the show, so we thank you very much for making that a reality and for uh, keeping a good thing going. All right, now, if you could like the video, again, if we uh, have everybody like the video that's tuned in right now, we'd be well over 100. Don't have to worry about it the rest of the way. And, uh, yeah, we appreciate y'all for, for making that happen. Okay. This was on the thumbnail of our live show. The SEC, the Southeastern Conference, pretty much known as the best conference in college football year in and year out. Is there a chance now they get left out of the college football playoff? I think there's a chance because it's a wacky world we're living in right now when it comes to this college football landscape and what different conferences are doing. I will also say this. I don't think it's likely. Like, I would be surprised if this were to happen, but as we sit here heading into week nine, right around 75% of the way through the regular college football season, there's a chance. There is a chance. Now, you're saying, hey, JD, if you line Georgia up there, if you line line Georgia out there up with uh, Washington, or if you line them out there uh, up with uh, insert whatever other college football potential Power Five conference champion, a North Carolina, if they win the ACC, like, is Georgia not favored? You know, they, they probably are favored. So that's not what I'm saying here. I'm not even saying that Georgia wouldn't still be able to win the college football playoff if they get in. But there's a couple scenarios here that we got to unpack just so we're kind of all on the same page and out ahead of this thing together. The first is, or the first scenario rather, is there could potentially be, and this is the obvious one, four Power Five undefeated conference champions with a one loss SEC champ, whether it's a one loss Alabama or a one loss Georgia. I think you get left out. So that would mean that you had Washington from the Pac-12, Florida State from the ACC, you had Oklahoma from the Big 12, and then from the Big 10, you had either Michigan or Ohio State go undefeated. If that happens, Georgia's left out. Bama's left out. With one loss, that is. If they're a one-loss conference champ. Now, if Georgia goes undefeated, wire to wire, they're in the dance. Don't think it's a big conversation. But the reason why this would happen We've seen the committee be very clear about this. Pretty cut and dry. You win all your games. You win your conference. You are into the college football playoff if you're from a Power 5 conference. There's not a ton of guessing with that. Pretty much the way that it's gone. And that would be unfortunate for the SEC. But it would, in that way, have you on the outside looking in. Now, the second scenario, I think, is a little bit more interesting. So let's unpack that right now. Let me make this clear. In this second scenario, this does not guarantee by any stretch of the imagination, that the SEC gets left out. This is what I like to call the it gets dicey scenario for the SEC. In this scenario, you have three undefeated Power Five conference champs. Pac-12 with Washington, the ACC with Florida State, the Big 12 with Oklahoma. Now, I think there's probably other scenarios that are out there that could potentially leave the SEC on the outside looking in, but I want to focus on this one because I think these are potentially the most likely, quote unquote, I just did air quotes for y'all that are listening on podcast. So you have those three conference champions that are undefeated. Then you have a one loss SEC champ and a one loss Big Ten champ. Now, the one loss Big Ten champion could be Michigan, could be Ohio State, could be Penn State. 
there's a lot of different variations into how that uh that one lost conference champ could end up being the Big Ten champ. So there's just a lot to jump into with that. That's a whole rabbit hole to go down. To put it simplistically, I think the Big Ten could have the best win and the best loss if you were to match them up with a Georgia. Now, if it's a one-loss Alabama, I think Alabama would actually end up getting the nod there because in theory, Alabama, if it were to hold with Chalk and they play Georgia in the, in the SEC title, they would have a win over number one Georgia, more than likely at that point. Let's, let's be generous and say number two Georgia. And their best loss would be to a top five Texas team. Okay, so in that way, I think Alabama would probably get the nod. That's where it gets dicey. But if it's not Alabama and it's Georgia and Georgia's a one loss conference champ, that means Georgia had a loss before the conference title game. That wasn't to Alabama, who was at that point in time, like probably a top five team. So where's that one loss coming from? In the best case scenario, that one loss for Georgia would be to Ole Miss. And Ole Miss right now, they're at 12 at the time of us being live. I don't think they're leapfrogging Penn State by anything that they're going to do the rest of the way, in my humble opinion. So the best loss across the board for, for the Big Ten is somewhere in that top eight range, in my opinion, by nature of what Penn State will be going forward. And Georgia's best loss would be, again, right around maybe it's a top 10 Ole Miss if they get to number 10. But again, at that point in time, I still think Penn State is considered the quote-unquote better loss. And then the better win at that point for for um any of these teams would be probably in the in the top five range for Michigan, Ohio State, or Penn State. So in that scenario, again, I don't think it guarantees the SEC gets left out, but that would be a situation where if Georgia's your one-loss conference champ, and you have a one-loss conference champ for the Big Ten with any variation of that Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan situation, that could leave things dicey for the SEC on the outside looking in. So what would this mean? Like, it's fun to talk about scenarios. It's fun to talk about what could happen, what might happen, what would happen, as this is like the last year of the four-team playoff, which, I mean, just so we're all clear, we support the four-team playoff. We are not for expansion. But what would it mean? I think, one, it would make the conversation around non-conference scheduling a little bit awkward because if Bama gets left out and they're a one-loss conference champ somehow and there's four undefeated conference champions, the Bama's saying, so we're penalized because we schedule Texas? Seriously? That's why we're getting left out, because we lost to a top five Texas team. All right. Okay. And again, that's how that would have to have four undefeated conference champions for that to happen. Now, what I also would say is if Georgia gets left out because they're a one-loss conference champion, and then you're saying, well, you should have scheduled more non-conference teams. You should have scheduled more, not, or not, not more non-conference teams. You should have scheduled better non-conference opponents. If I'm Georgia, I'm saying, we tried. <laughs> We tried to have Oklahoma. It got vetoed. What do you mean we should have scheduled better non-conference opponents? We, we, we put the kibosh on us playing the Sooners. What are you talking about? Now, all this kind of becomes a moot point as we move to 12 anyway. But the statement I think that's made across the landscape is we just have some really good teams in college football. Like this was just a really fun year across the board. Conference to conference. We had a lot of parity. We had a lot of good things going on across the board when it comes to college football. And there'd be a, a large a large uh, piece of the SEC fan base, and I don't blame y'all saying, well, we can't wait till we expand the playoff. This is, we got, we got done in by the four-team playoff. That's what did us in. I see where you're coming from, but I would also say how many times has a one-loss non, non-champion from the SEC found their way in? I think you look back at the SEC and say it was just kind of a, a, a year where the rankings weren't quite as beefy for this conference across the board and the schedule didn't play out in favor to get a team in. But, Nine times out of 10, I would say it has. Now, a lot of people would say this, and this is where I want to make sure we really hone in on. You'll hear a lot of people say, well, there you have it. SEC is overrated. SEC is not the best conference in college football. There's a discussion to be had year in and year out about who has the best year when it comes to the college football landscape and conference by conference. But if people are going to say the SEC isn't the best conference from a macro level, I would say let's watch the NFL draft. Let's watch the NFL draft, see which players go where, and then we can have that conversation around who's the most talented conference, who's the best conference top to bottom. Because the SEC, for the most part, outside of that game with LSU and Florida State, like we're not seeing a ton of SEC versus other non-conference teams matchup. And that's Alabama-Texas as well. That'll be an SEC matchup going forward. What I want to say is let's kind of safeguard against the the SEC isn't really that good logic if we get one of these situations. Because I think that's just, quite frankly, not a... 
not an educated statement to make based on a small sample size of one year of the SEC getting left out of the playoff with a one loss conference champ. Like that's, I, I think we're kind of extrapolating too much from this situation if that does happen. What I think you would have to say is, this is why we love the regular season. I think if anything, you point to the 12 team playoff and say, why do we need that? Because people have been frustrated with the SEC because they always get their way. They always find their way into the college football playoff. They always get the benefit of the doubt. And it's like, well, really? It doesn't look like it in this situation. Looks like the SEC actually got left out in this situation. So everyone that was shouting and, and crying in some ways for a 12-team playoff because it was favoring the SEC too much, like I think you look at this and say, you already had a playoff during the regular season. You, you got, a, you got not, not a 12-team playoff. You got a 12-week playoff. How awesome is that? So that's me kind of on my soapbox a little bit. I want to hear from y'all. Let me know in the comment section. Let me know in the live chat what you think about the expanded playoff, which I don't know if I even should ask that, but let me know. And uh, let me know your thoughts on the potential of the SEC being let, left out of the college football playoff because that would be shocking in every sense of the word. That would be, that would be uh, something we did not have on the bingo card at the beginning of the year, but it's kind of one of those years in college football, and we're excited to see how it plays out. So we'll see, man. <laughs> Isn't that just like the bumper sticker for college football this year? We'll see, man. We'll see. Uh, we are right around 50 likes. If everyone tuned in right now could hit that thumbs up icon under the picture, be well over 100. We would appreciate y'all enormously for that. So it's college football season. Games being played, a lot to talk about. And I want us to just sort of not take a detour, but kind of take a quick look to I guess whatever is out the window of the bus that is college football. And there's recruiting out there. So one, make sure you're subscribed here, but also to the On3 Recruits channel because Josh Newberg and company are crushing it over there. Make sure you're subscribed. They're going to keep you in the know for every single thing you need to know about the college football landscape when it comes to recruiting. Now, I want to talk about a big-time commit that Texas got yesterday, and that is Ryan Wingo, five-star wide receiver out of St. Louis, Missouri, 6'1 and a half, 210 pounds, so pretty big frame there, but dude can move 10, 6, 100 meters. We love that he's got that ability to take the top off the defense, but also really good after the catch, really good in space, has ability to make guys miss. Uh, we got to talk to him at the On3 NIL Elite Series event in Nashville. We got to sit down and do a quick interview with him. And I'll say this, like getting to sit down with Ryan, man, the way he carries himself, dude is just a pro already in high school like on time to everything going on with the event, handled himself tremendous in the interview, says all the right things, carries himself like a professional would. So Texas is getting a, a stud in that sense and a stud on the field. But let's take a macro look at this thing because we are a college football show. They got a big time commit in Ryan Wingo, who's going to be a weapon for them. And I think that's really where the emphasis has to lie within this conversation around his commitment. This to me is another step in ensuring that the Steve Sarkeesian offense will have the weapons that he wants and needs to operate his offense at a dangerous level. Because think about Steve Sarkeesian, the way that he runs things. Whenever he has multiple playmakers on the outside, Texas is going to be really good. And that kind of sounds simplistic, but I mean, by nature of how he runs this thing, anytime he has multiple go-to guys as a defense, you don't have enough resources to distribute across the board to give the proper attention to different weapons. This year is a perfect example. Xavier Worthy, Adonai Mitchell. Xavier Worthy is a really good player, but when you add Adonai Mitchell into the mix and, oh, you sprinkle in Jatavian Sanders, that was the difference against Texas. Xavier Worthy, we had prize picks on him. He had, five and a, he had a five and a half catch number going into that game. We took the more. He had five catches at half. We're like, all right, baby, here we go. One more catch, Xavier. That more is going to hit. Alabama did a great job taking him away because they're like, we're tired of this dude catching the football on us. So what did Texas do? Adonai Mitchell, deep, was the difference maker, was the dagger multiple times in that second half. I think Ryan Wingo joining that receiving core with a John Tay Cook and the rest of the young talent they're going to have in that room, like, I'm excited for what they're going to do. Because I think, like I said, the number, the quantity, and the quality of weapons they have now is going to really put defenses in conflict and give you a problem taking away that potent attack from Texas. Now, I would also say this. Whenever... Uh, Whenever Texas does well on the recruiting trail, you hear a lot of people say, well, this isn't new for Texas. Texas has always had talent. It's a matter of can they, can they do anything with it? 
A lot of guys go to Texas, never hear from them again. Yeah, maybe so in the past. I think that's old Texas. I think this is new Texas. Texas right now is a top 10 team in the on three industry team recruiting rankings. And it just kind of feels different around Texas. And that kind of sounds funny to say because it's abstract and there's not a ton of like validity to just saying it feels different. But when you look at what they've done on the field, I think you can point to that and say that is different. I think what Steve Sarkeesian has done there has provided something different to buy into if I'm on the recruiting trail. And I don't doubt they're they're well resourced when it comes to the NIL landscape. Newsflash, NIL is now a part of college football recruiting. It is, period, mic drop, the end. If you don't think it is, you're kidding yourself. I'm not talking about that specific to this recruitment, but you got a lot of people saying, well, Texas is just buying players. I think that's kind of salty fans saying salty things. But going back to my original point, there is a proof of concept now in Austin that gives recruits something to buy into, both on the field by nature of how they're performing. The win over Alabama is like an album cover kind of win that you can go and put on the recruiting trail to kids and say, hey, come come be a part of this as we get to the SEC next year. That's the first. But I think you also have proof of concept in development. And I would imagine that was always the negative pitch against Texas. Hey, you got a lot of stars next to your name. You got a lot of ability. There have been a lot of guys with ability that have gone to Austin and never been heard from again. You sure you want to do that? You sure you want to go to Texas and risk it that way? I don't think that's the same conversation now with Steve Sarkeesian. One, because of his track record at different schools. Talk about Devontae Smith and what he's doing in the league right now. Jalen Waddle when he was there, like all that he did at Alabama and the hand he had in getting those guys involved. But also at Texas right now. Like Adonai Mitchell, he was good at Georgia. I think he's taken his game to a new level at Texas by nature of what they've asked him to do in that offense. Xavier Worthy. I think he's got a very legitimate chance to be selected early in the NFL draft. Now, I'm not a draft guy, but you would have to imagine there's a lot of NFL teams that could use Xavier Worthy. Jatavian Sanders, he's balling right now. Like He's probably going to be a guy that gets some NFL looks when it's time for him to roll. All this to say, you can, one, you can win games at Texas, but you can get developed, in my opinion. And I think Ryan Wingo sees that, and I have to imagine that was a factor in him choosing to be a Longhorn. Now, you also have to imagine the Arch Manning effect, Probably some ripples here being sent throughout the college football landscape as he's in line, you would imagine, to be the guy at some point in time in Austin. Don't think that hurt things with landing a wide receiver like Ryan Wingo. I think the strong finish on the field now for Texas only builds security for kids picking Texas. And what I mean by that is I think it's similar to Colorado in the way they provided proof of concept. There's this question of, well, am I going to actually get the experience I think I can get when I go to Texas or when I go to Colorado? And it's different at Colorado than it is at Texas because Colorado has much less data to work with. But when you talk about Texas, again, there's this feeling, will I get developed? Will we win games? Is this a flash in the pan? Is this a one-year thing? And the better Texas does going forward now, especially without Quinn Ewers, you can look back at the organization, look back at the system and say, hey, this is for real. This is... Yes, a personnel-driven operation, but at the end of the day, this is a this is a organization-driven operation to the same extent. Like, personnel is going to change here, but the system we have in place with how we do things with our standards, we're going to be able to be successful regardless of who's in uniform for us. Now, we need you to come be a part of it, but I think this is something that moves that operation forward. So, from a macro level, I think there's things to take away if you're a Texas fan. From an in-the-weeds perspective, Ryan Wingo is a dude. I expect him to be a dude when he gets to Austin. Big-time get for them, landing him out of St. Louis, Missouri, beating out Mizzou for him. Texas adding another elite playmaker of the five-star caliber to their weaponry. When he gets on campus, Steve Sarkeesian has another guy to throw the football to. And uh, it feels like the rich get richer when it comes to playmakers in Austin, at least. So I'm sure they're very happy to have him on board. Uh, I'll, I'll keep plugging this because Thursdays, you understand, like y'all are at work. We're kind of getting things rolling. I know not everybody's able to be tuned in live. So if you could like the video, it's going to take all of us here to get us over 100, right around 67 likes. If you could like the video, get us over 100. We would appreciate that greatly. So every single Thursday, we do this exercise because we predict our games on Tuesday. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss when we predict our games. Want to make sure you're all dialed in for that. Make sure we have everybody involved here when we do predict our games. Uh, When it comes to Thursdays, though, we give you our final thoughts and predictions are kind of a part of that for these games, but we're not picking games. We're giving you predictions for those games, rather. And so we want to go matchup by matchup here, some of the big big spots for a lot of these teams. Now, I don't know there's a bigger spot this week when it comes to the brands than Georgia-Florida. 
Now, obviously, Georgia favored by two touchdowns, but they're without Brock Bowers. And I think for Georgia, you're looking for somebody to step up and be the production filler. 26%, I've said it a lot, but I'll say it again, 26% of the pass yards from Carson Beck to this point in the year have gone to Brock Bowers. A lot of passing yards now to step up and someone to fill that void. I think this is the Dominique Lovett game. Because quite frankly, there's nobody better in the country at the next man up mentality than what Kirby Smart and Georgia have created there. They brought in Dominique Lovett for a reason. I think he's starting to catch his stride after transferring from Missouri. I love Dominique Lovett to step up in this game because I think he's dynamic. And when you're dynamic, you're tough to match up with. Like it's tough to play man coverage in the slot against anybody. If you want to give him zone coverage, that's a lot of room for that guy to work. I think he'll take advantage of that. I think schematically for Georgia, when you lost Brock Bowers, you lost somebody to really effectively work the middle of the field. Dominic Lovett playing in the slot. I think he's going to be that guy for you. Now, I'm not sitting here pretending that Dominic Lovett's going to do it the same way that Brock Bowers did. I think it'll look different. But I do think when it comes to being able to make those safeties play honest and be able to come up and, and tackle whenever you do hit that intermediate pass game, I think Dominic Lovett, one, will be that guy. Two, I expect him to do some good things after the catch. So expecting a big game from Dominic Lovett this Saturday against Florida. For Florida now, we talked about it early in the week in our prediction for this game. I said, if I'm Austin Armstrong, defensively, swing for the chin. Meaning, let's go for that knockout early. Knockout's the wrong word to use. But let's throw a haymaker early. Let's try, let's try and connect here. I think the same thing is true for the offensive side of the ball. Because think about it this way. If you're Florida and I throw a haymaker in round one, what happens in a boxing match when I get my opponent real good on the chin in round one? It changes the rest of the fight, right? I'm probably a little bit wobbly. I'm probably a little bit easier fatigued. I'm probably a little bit more tentative if I'm trying to throw punches and you just connected with one on the chin against me. And if Florida does that offensively, I think that changes the tempo they can play at the rest of the game. So the thought slash prediction in this one is if, I, if I'm Florida, I'm, I'm expecting, or rather if I'm Georgia and I'm playing Florida, I'm expecting Florida to kind of try and play ground and pound, to try and control the line of scrimmage, to, play, to try and play with tempo. Why don't you zig when everybody else zags here? Why don't we kind of break a tendency? Dial one up to Ricky Pearsall. Dial one up to Eugene Wilson, whoever it ends up being. Let's take a shot early. And if we hit on that and it's 7-0 Florida, momentum builds, belief builds. And going back to what I said, you can play at your pace then. Then you make, you make Georgia and Carson Beck try and chase you. Now, that's a delicate formula to address, but I think that's got to be the way that Florida approaches this game playing against the number one team in the country, Georgia Bulldogs. Now, we got Texas. Interesting spot. No Quinn Ewers. It's going to be Malik Murphy. My prediction here is I think we see some wow moments from Malik Murphy. Now, I'm not saying we see the wow box score. I'm not saying he goes for 400 yards and five touchdowns. I mean, I guess that scenario is possible. But I think you, you see him make some throws where you say, oh, that's not a backup quarterback throw. There's a reason he was as highly recruited as he was. There's a reason why they took this kid virtually before he had any varsity starts out of Southern California. And we talk about his arm talent. I think that's been displayed via the spring game. But the reason why I think he's going to have some wow moments, one, what I just said, the ability. The second part of this, this isn't new to Malik Murphy. Like Malik Murphy didn't enroll this past spring and is now trying to get up to speed with the offense. That's not shade on Arch Manning. I'm saying that's not Malik Murphy's situation. Malik Murphy's been in this scheme for a certain period of time. He knows what he's doing. He knows the controls of the spaceship. He knows where the button is for the break, for the nitrous, for the blast off, all that. Like he understands how to work this offense. Now it's going to take a second for him to get comfortable, I believe. But that's the third part of this. I think they're going to run the football for him and that's going to create some more open shots downfield. Like we, we talked about it in our preview. BYU's not great stopping the run. They're averaging right around four and a half yards of carry given up. So when that happens and that defense starts to get aggressive, Xavier Worthy, downfield. Adonai Mitchell, downfield. Like you got, some, you got some options open is what I'm trying to say for Malik Murphy. And I think he's got the ability to get it to them just fine. For Tennessee now, big game against Kentucky. Very big game against Kentucky. Trying to bounce back from the Bama loss. And we said it in our, in our reaction video from the Tennessee-Alabama game for Tennessee. And like, it just feels to me like you need somebody else to step up in that wide receiving room. 
I think Squirrel White's awesome. We talked about Squirrel White having to be a guy for Tennessee last week, and he was all that, and then some over 100 yards, multiple catches, had a touchdown to start the game. Like, they were rolling. But the issue was, in that second half, Alabama said, okay, you got Squirrel White. We're playing this run defense relatively well at this point in time. We're going to kind of keep it all in front of us, and you have to beat us, Joe Milton. Now, that's partly true because I think you you do ask the quarterback to beat you. you got to deliver. That's 100% true. And Joe Milton, at times, left more to be desired. But I think the real thing here is you have to have more than just one wide receiver win for you. So my thought here, you need Dante Thornton to step up here. This needs to be the moment where Dante Thornton emerges. I mean, he's a unique blend of, of size and speed, big frame, can run like a deer. Like, he's got to be able to step up in this spot. Because I think Kentucky probably saw that tape too and says, okay, Squirrel White, we're going to give him extra attention. Can Dante Thornton win one-on-one and give Joe Milton someone to throw to? And it's got to be semi-consistent in my opinion. Because if you can do that and you make Kentucky off balance in the pass game, maybe the run game opens up a little bit more like Tennessee already wants to do. Kentucky, they're not great against the pass. They're pretty good against the run. We'll see how that whole cat and mouse game shakes out. But again, I think Dante Thornton has to be the guy this week for Tennessee to step up because we talk a lot about Joe Milton that's fair I understand but before we blame Joe Milton look at that wide receiver room and see if anybody's separating outside of Squirrel White consistently I think Dante Thornton's the guy this week you talked about him a lot in the offseason being a guy to step up and emerge we did for sure transfer from Oregon like ton of ability can we see it in this game can we see it in this game I'm excited to watch that I think he's got to be the guy now we have uh we had the anxiety bowl last week I suppose with Miami and Clemson I think we have the anxiety bowl round two here with South Carolina and A&M. South Carolina going to A&M, 14 and a half point dog. Like whoever loses this game, there's going to be a fair amount of noise. I'll start with South Carolina. If they lose, they go to two and six and they have to win out to make a bowl game with Kentucky and Clemson both left on the schedule. Now there's going to be some volume that goes up this off season. I don't think there's anything with Shane Beamer losing his job in South Carolina to be real. I, I do. I would be, I would be blown away if that somehow became a reality, but just the off season, the chatter around your program, the chatter around what South Carolina didn't do, the chatter around underachieving and what you don't have on the line of scrimmage. You'd like to avoid that. (laughs) You'd like to kind of keep a good thing going and kind of keep some momentum there for the recruiting trail as well, where I think Shane Beamer is going to make some hay as well. If they uh, can get things going on the field, not novel analysis, but how we feel it would put a lot of pressure on next year is my overall takeaway. If they lose this game, and put themselves in a corner to make a bowl game. The real stress, though, is all in College Station. If AM lost, they would drop to 4-4. Four and four. They still have games at Ole Miss and at LSU left on their schedule. We talked about it last week. Hey, what if, what if Jimbo Fisher and company, what if, what if they go 7-5? and five? What if they go 8-4? and four? Y'all, what if they go 6-6? Six and six? That's a very big what if, but if you drop this game and Spencer Rattler just gets to dealing, the conversation in College Station would get very uncomfortable. And I've been very hesitant to jump on the firing Jimbo Fisher train for a couple of reasons. Buyout's enormous. Guy has a track record. Guy has a ton of talent in his locker room, which in some sense, I guess, is an indictment if they don't succeed this year. If they go six and six, man, I have a hard time believing those boosters won't find a way to get that buyout taken care of. And that sounds crazy because it would be in the neighborhood of $70 million, I think a little bit less based on uh, the way that it's shaped up, right around six, sixty-seven and a half million. and a half million. Even so, like that's a ridiculous sum of money, but to go six and six after being five and seven last year, I think they'd find a way to do it. I think they'd find a way to do it. Now, losing this game doesn't guarantee that you go six and six. They could still find a way to win out and go eight and four if they drop this game. And that kind of changes what's being said in College Station. But like all that's to say, man, you don't want to lose this game if you're AM. Two touchdown favorites at home. South Carolina's got two wins. You got to find a way to get it done if you're AM. And if you don't, the, tr- the trajectory, the nose of that airplane is pointing down. And it would get it would get very loud and uncomfortable. And again, I think the boosters would find a way to uh, to take care of things in College Station. So that's how we feel about that. But hoping that doesn't happen. We, we root for everyone to keep their job on this show. Like, we hope everyone has a job at the end of the day, college football and not. And, uh, yeah, we, we do not root for head coaches to lose their job. But there is some sense of, 
hey, what are we doing here if we're in College Station? So appreciate everybody tuned in live. I'll ask one more time. If we could get a like on this video, if you're all watching, be well over 100. We appreciate you all for that. I have one more ad read to get through. Probably be somewhere in the range of a minute. So while I'm doing this ad read, get in the live chat. Let me know. What do you think about this weekend? What are you calling when it comes to, to upsets? What are you thinking about Ryan Wingo to Texas? What do you think about the SEC maybe being left, maybe being left out of the playoff? Would love to hear from you all right now. So get in the live chat. Let us know. And we will uh, we'll keep a good thing going. The hard count is brought to you all by our friends at Game Time. Now, I want to talk about a, a specific instance for me where I was looking for tickets. We have a chance to go and watch big-time college football game. I won't give you teams. It was in the Big 12 Conference. And it was a game of very high importance. And at this point in time, I was in college. And so at this point in time, there are student tickets that are going to be given out. Y'all, student tickets went like that. Like you could be in the queue for however long you wanted. Very, very few people got student tickets to this game. So what I wish we had had is game time. Because if, if I had game time, man, I wouldn't have worried about student tickets. Because you know why? I would have known that I was going to get the best price for whatever tickets were out there for this specific game. I wouldn't have had to have the anxiety. wouldn't have had to stress. I would have known game time would have had me covered just like they have y'all covered. Game time is phenomenal in the sense that you can wait till the very last minute to get your tickets. Like I could have woken up on that Saturday morning and said, okay, the, the stadium's about an hour away. I can, buy, I can buy tickets with like two taps of my finger here on this app. I'm gonna be able to get this done. So no worries about that. Game time would have had me covered. Also, again, I would have known I'm not spending money in a meaningless way. I would have known that game time is the best, like I said, best price is guaranteed. And if I had found tickets in the same section and row for like somehow a lesser price on another platform, game time would have had a game time guarantee built in there and said, you know what? We'll, we'll credit you 110% of the difference, JD. That's how much we care about you and care about you watching this football game. So last thing I'll say, game time does a great job in the sense that they, uh, they make sure you can see the view before you buy. Like you're not going to show up to a game and realize that you're actually sitting right behind a concrete wall so you can't see three-fourths of the field when you're watching. Game Time's got you covered. So here's what I want us to do. Download the Game Time app. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets. Create an account. If you use code HARDCOUNT, you get $20 off your first purchase. Okay, so terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem code H-A-R-D-C-O-U-N-T for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Don't be on the outside looking in. Don't be the guy where all your friends go to the game and they say, hey, why didn't you go? I didn't have tickets. Game Time, no excuses. They got us covered. They got y'all covered. And we appreciate them tremendously for having us covered. So to break down your thoughts, feelings, concerns on the landscape that is college football right now, I want to bring in the heavy lifter extraordinaire Nick break. Now, Nick, a lot of people have thoughts on college football right now. I want to get to those, but you and I have not talked this morning about what happened last night in your playoff kickball game. So we're getting to the questions, but let me know. How did it go? Are we still playing playoff kickball? how did we do at the plate overall? Give me the bullet points and uh, yeah, what's going on there, man? Yeah. So it was sweet 16. You win, you play the elite eight. We're playing a colleague, Garrett, um, in the Sweet 16, one one, we go to extra innings. We played two different, two more extra innings. We went on a walk off. We walked the game. You off. walked it off. Um, wasn't me, unfortunately, but um, buddy Sean uh, crossed home plate. We got the win. Then we played this other team. Let's we're, go. We're, we're playing this team who's the 16 seed. They had just beaten the one seed, and something's not right. And we're losing by five or by three in the final inning. And the umpire overhears them talking. And he's realizing that they're playing with illegal players um, that were on the team, which is not allowed. No way. So the game got forfeited and we won. So we're moving on. <laughs> Let's Hey, by any means. By any by means. By any means. It doesn't matter. They, they were very grumpy. I will tell you that they wanted to, uh, to fight some of our players. Um, I had to go in and, and dip. Like, I had to be a diplomat. Wait, so how did, so explain it to me. How did you know they were players that weren't on their team? How did, how did we sniff well, this Well, you're, you're required to wear your team shirt, 
and they had players wearing like just really, really random stuff. No um, way. And yeah, it, it was man. It was a, it was an awkward moment, man. I'm telling you, it it was a really strange. Like everyone from the other games had this their finish. They all kind of gathered around and watched it unfold. <laughs> but Tanner Martin, yes, it, it was a kickball scandal. I got people saying Michigan kickball team. <laughs> No. Yeah, yeah, we played. They they were the no. yellow team. They were the yellow team. So perhaps they were. It was perhaps it was Mace, and it wasn't yellow. Oh my gosh, were they the, were they the stallions? Um, they they might they might have been the stallions. They, they might he might have been on the sidelines. I, man, they were See, they were videotaping some of our hand signals. Man, so that's the thing, Nick. That's where I fall. Where I'm like, hey, if you're stealing signs, I, I could take it or leave it in terms of impact on a game. If you're switching players. If Michigan's switching players and they're going and grabbing Buddy from <laughs> Alabama to come play in the college football playoff with them, then we have an issue. Then we can have a real conversation around like mm-hmm. some heavier penalties for Michigan. Yeah. So maybe we're in the minority there, Nick. But hey, a dub is a dub. We're moving on. We got kickball tonight. No, no. Next week, forty-nine degrees is the high next Ooh. Wednesday. So that'll be a crisp November evening for some kickball. That's kickball weather, baby. That that's is run kickball the ball weather. weather. That's kickball weather. Well, yep. hey. Congrats on the dub, my guy. Appreciate it, man. Congrats on the dub. Yeah, appreciate that's it. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. That's that's us clapping for Nick, if y'all listen on podcast. What do you say we get to some questions? Let's do it, brother. Let's do it. Um, I'm going to start uh, with Boosted931. Um, uh, there's some questions before and some after, but I like this one. This is interesting. What happens to Coach Beamer if it's true that he bought signals from Michigan before the Tennessee game last year? Would Beamer be fired uh, and, kept out, and kept out of the playoffs? Did that happen? Is that so, I, that's uh, why I want to ask this? Is maybe like, I'm is behind this on true? the eight ball here. I haven't seen anything about that. If that's true, there would obviously be some repercussions. Uh, I don't know anything about that. So I'm gonna, is I'm gonna, this a I'm joke? Withhold judgment. At this I'm point very gullible, so I wanted to ask: Is this real? Boosted? Not I don't. Real. I don't think that's real. I know there was a deal <laughs> with uh, with him potentially uh, accepting a leaked game plan when he was uh-huh. somewhere else ahead of like a Wake Forest game. Uh, Bottom line, I don't think anybody should get fired for what went down at Michigan outside yeah. of maybe that staffer. Evan that, that, said that, that was reported last has. night slash this morning. It is real, Nick. We we don't know about that. That this is bro- yeah, breaking. Yeah, I'm gonna news. withhold. I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure I don't say anything that's yeah, that's and that's untrue. fair so because gonna, we don't I mean, we don't hey, want to do stick that. around. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss what's going on here. Yeah, we'll, we might uh, be we'll on about, later. We'll talk about something going forward here. That's uh, yeah. All right. Wow. There we okay. Go. That's a. That's that's kind of strange. Okay. I feel like I feel like that would have been a little bit more. I feel like we would have known in our ear. You know, I'm going to check in the Twitter newsroom. We're going through here. Didn't hear anything Nick. about that. Yeah. You. Sorry. I'm, I'm, so while JD on does this, that, yeah, he, he's going to uh, look into that a little more. Hey, uh, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Obviously, preparing for this show a lot on uh, on show days. Sometimes we miss some things, but um, it's a good question. Um, a lot of people asking about the kickball team, kickball scandal. Um, Briley, who got me earlier with a, a Yo Mama joke, um, said because they're eighth graders about the other team, hopefully about the other team, not me. Um, man. I don't know about the South Carolina yeah, stuff, man. Yeah, that's gotten me a little, that's I got think me that's, a little I think off. that's some, uh, some conspiracy theory stuff going on. I'm looking at Twitter. My, my, my feel is it would be all over if this was a yeah. legitimate thing. So I'm going to go ahead and let's, let, let's keep a good thing going. But uh, if, if there's anything else that comes out, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll, 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 as you say, put a pin in that one. We'll put a pin in that one. Okay, I like sounds it. good. I like sounds it. good. Okay, Austin Rogers. We'll get get to the next one. JD, during the off season, will you be keeping the Tuesday through Thursday sh- show model we have now? Man, that's funny you asked that because Nick and I were talking about that yesterday. We were saying we would love to. We would love to keep the the Tuesday through Thursday model. We're gonna have to circle up after the season. Uh, the, I would say this, like any other business. We operate on supply and demand. So if you if you like us going on Wednesdays, like one, let us know, and, and two, make sure you're subscribing, make sure you're liking, make sure you're telling your friends to come in and watch. Because like, if there is a demand for a Tuesday, for a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday operation, we will one thousand percent do that. If we don't have a live show, we'll still have content on that Wednesday. Um, my personal vote would be to keep the Wednesday show, and we'll see what happens after the fact. I think uh, I think it's a lot of fun getting getting to go live with y'all and have this interaction in real time and. Yeah, so I guess all that's to say, another pin in that one. We'll see. Yeah. But if you do like the Wednesday show, let us know. And uh, let us know by nature of how you're interacting with the traffic as y'all 
have yeah. been to this point. So thank you for that. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it matters how many likes we get, how many comments, how many yeah, views. Hey, that I mean, matters. What, five away from 100, but who's um, counting? Yeah, Besides exactly. YouTube, I guess YouTube's counting. Austin says, thanks, gentlemen. You're very appreciate welcome, it, Austin. Austin. We appreciate you um, very much. Okay, next question. Matthew, does North Carolina loss, does their loss affect – Florida State's chances at the college football playoffs. Huh. If an undefeated FSU team beats UNC or Louisville in Charlotte, would that even be enough? Or do I need to start rooting for some for the stronger Michigan or uh, something like that to pad our resume? Yeah, that's a very good question. My feel on this, Nick, is if Florida State runs the table, regardless of who they play in that conference title game, if they finish undefeated ACC champion, I don't think they'll get left out for a couple of reasons, the first of which being the way they played LSU and the way that game looked, I'm of the opinion that you should freeze your win when it happens. So like if a team gets a win over a top five team and that top five team the rest of the way ends up being pretty bad, yeah, maybe you factor that into a degree in terms of like, hey, it wasn't as good of a win as we thought it was at the time. But I, I do still think you have to credit that to be like a top 10, top five kind of level win for what it was. So I think Florida State, the way they played LSU is going to help them going forward. And uh, so I, I still think Florida State's in no matter what. The team on the outside looking in, in my opinion, Nick, we did a segment on this during our live show last week. I think Oklahoma's got to kind of be feeling uneasy. Like if, if they run the table and we get five undefeated conference champions, Georgia's not getting left out going wire to wire. Michigan not left out wire to wire. Or Ohio State, if they beat Michigan, and they're, you know, three right now, they're not getting left out. Um, the ACC, like I just said, Florida State, they're not getting left out. The Pac-12 has been throwing a party before they sell the house with all those ranked teams. If Washington runs the table, they're not getting left out. Oklahoma, if they run the table and they're undefeated, you have two big-time wins over Texas – but like, where else are we finding the juice on, on the resume? Now, they wanted to play Georgia. That didn't happen. I'm just saying I think Oklahoma, their resume wouldn't match up as well. Whether it's right or wrong, I think that's the case. But uh, yeah, so all that to say, I think Florida State, you take care of business, you're in the dance from where I'm standing. Okay, yeah. Hey, over 100. Big, big shout there to y'all. Appreciate it. Appreciate there we it. Go. That's big time. A um, few more questions, Jay. We're actually doing pretty good on time today. Tanner awesome. Martin. JD, do you think Lincoln Riley leaves USC for the NFL? He missed two practices this week for sickness. So I would say this. I do not think the sickness thing is related to his future when it comes to the NFL. You do kind of start to feel like the NFL and just the calendar. Like, I don't know Lincoln Riley personally. I'm sure he loved being a college football coach. I'm sure he loved being a college football coach in L.A., I think we're going to lose some people from the collegiate ranks because of how demanding it is. Like th there is never an, an off season when it comes to college football. That's the reason why we get to have this show. But if you're a coach or your support staff or you're a personnel person, like you hear a lot of people saying this, like this is just becoming impossible if you work within the sport at a team level to have anything outside of a work life. Now, some people don't care about having the, the work-life balance and that's fine. But I, I do think that for Lincoln Riley, he's got a family. He's probably going to have some opportunities in the NFL you'd imagine at some point in time so I don't know if he's jumping to the NFL like this upcoming season um, but I do think that there is something to watch for with him maybe over the course of, of the next couple of years I do think he's staying at USC for the foreseeable future um, mm -hmm. I'd be surprised if he left after this year to be real but just overall the NFL is, is always going to be a factor when it comes to collegiate jobs transitioning to NFL jobs because of like I said just how demanding it is yeah Sounds good, JD. Uh, this is a double question. I'm going to double up two people's questions like right it. here. C Dog said, "What are your thoughts on Florida upsetting Georgia? Uh, where do Georgia fall if they lose?" Ooh. But um, this is uh, to add on to that. Uh, we've got, uh, excuse me, Gavin. I'm trying to find Gavin's message. There it is. Thoughts on Georgia's questionable run, uh, questionable run defense. And uh, Georgia's tough O line. So just talk about that game a little bit more, JD. I know you gave your final thoughts, but give your final part two thoughts. Yeah, man, absolutely. Uh, so when it comes to Florida and their potential to upset, uh, we talked about it, like they, they got to start fast. Graham Mertz has to be dealing, and those are kind of like no duh statements. A guy to watch in this game is Eugene Wilson. He's kind of the X factor for me every single week with Florida because of the kind of change of pace playmaker that I think he is. He's a guy that can put pressure on the perimeter of a defense. And you ask this, like Georgia's run defense, over the course of the season, 
there's a little bit left to be desired, but these last couple of games, we've seen Georgia kind of turn up the heat. They've allowed like less than three yards of carry in these last two games. Now, one of those games is Vanderbilt, but the other is Kentucky, and Kentucky likes to run the football. They've been really good at running the football. Just ask Florida. So for Florida, I do think it's a pass to run situation, in my opinion. I think you throw deep or you try and challenge vertically a little bit to keep that defense honest. And then if you can get the run game off of that going with a softer box, that would be the way that I would approach it. How far would Georgia drop? I think they're still in the top 10. Um, I'd probably, without knowing what's going to happen the rest of the weekend, probably put them somewhere in that like nine range, maybe 10 range. Now, Florida, when, you know, wouldn't be the quote unquote best loss on your resume if you're Georgia, but I still think they're probably somewhere in that top 10 by nature of what they have uh, potentially available the rest of the season. Um, the second question was Georgia and their, and their run defense and their, and their offensive line. And the uh, yeah. offensive line, like, this is actually a good question here because, Nick, I put something out on Twitter last night where I said, hey, I wouldn't be surprised. It was a clip from the show. I said, I wouldn't be surprised if Georgia gets downhill like Kentucky did. And, dude, Florida Twitter just hammered me, just came after me and was like, no, duh. No, duh, Georgia's going to try and run the rock against us because of what Kentucky did. Well, I think the context that I should have provided there and wish I had provided there was Georgia's actually a more pass-heavy team. Like, we think of the brand for Georgia. We think of the big offensive line and physicality and SEC trenches. But, like, they're throwing the ball 37 times a game. And so, without Brock Bowers in the lineup now, you also can't go as much 12 personnel with two tight ends, which helps you running the football. So, the sentiment is it would be a little bit uncharacteristic if we saw Georgia just go sledgehammer mode against Florida. So, I think they may end up doing that, like we talked about. But uh, that's the context there when it comes to uh, to Georgia and their uh, – their potential to kind of kind of switch up the game plan a little bit with no Brock Bowers. Mm-hmm. Man, we're getting a lot of really good questions. I love today. it, man. What do you say? Two more? Yeah, Let's two more. It. It's going to be tough to choose, but we'll get to them. Uh, Evan's been asking this one a lot, so I want to make sure I get to Evan. Um, this might seem like a wild possibility, but it is cur- is it currently? Or excuse me, but it is currently possible for the Big Ten West to be a six-way tie for all of them being three and three in the West and four and five in the Big Ten. Ooh. Could this happen? Uh, is it likely? JD, just what are your thoughts on, to me, one of the most interesting divisions within a conference in college football, which there aren't many, I guess. But I, th- I think Purdue made the conference title game last year. I could be off on this. I think they were like eight and four. Like, I think Purdue at eight and four found their way into the conference title game. So all that's to say, like, it's, I, I looked up the Big Ten tiebreaker rules today. Let me tell you, they are vast. Like, I thought about trying to explain it during that segment where we talked about the SEC getting left out. And uh, to be honest, it was just too much of a rabbit hole. It would almost be its own other segment. So maybe we'll do it as a segment. Um, Big Ten West is anarchy. Similar to the Pac-12, they're doing just a party before they turn the lights off over. They're going to make it really tough to see who ends up getting to Indianapolis you still probably lean Iowa, even with their loss against Minnesota, even with, you know, no Cade McNamara the rest of the way. I think the defense is just so good. So I don't think we'll see a six-way tie, but if I had to pick a horse today, I'd, I'd pick Iowa. Wisconsin with no Tanner Mordecai, just a, an ultimate downer for everyone in Madison because you were expecting so much from that offense and the new look Wisconsin. Like, I was pumping them up before the season. Could still get there, but it would be a little bit more surprising if they were to, to do it with uh, – without Tanner Mordecai being available, if that were the case. So I don't think we'll get a six-way tie, but the Big Ten West is must-see TV if you love college football, which is funny to say, but I think it is based on just how they uh, – It is. Just the, the parody there. You, we get asked for parody a lot in college football. There's enough parody to go around in the Big Ten West. Yeah. There, there's parody. It's just not as much at the very top of, of the league. Um, we love it. Man, like I said, there are some really good questions. I put it in the live chat, but if we don't get to your question, hit JD up on Instagram, at JDBKL, DM him your question, and you get to those on your story on Fridays, right? JD? Yes, sir. Yeah, so okay. follow me on Instagram, at JDBKL, or Friday morning, rather. I put the call to action out there, put a little sticker up, say, hey, let me know. You want to talk college football? We'll talk about it. You want to talk non-college football? We'll talk about it. We've talked about everything from Drake and, and our thoughts on the album, we've talked to everything with, you know, pregame, game day, you know, routine. So we, we, we talk everything on that story. But if you want to get in there, make sure you're following me there. One, for that story and for answering questions like we're doing right now. Second, we put our best bets 
on that platform as well. So I want to plug that really quick, Nick. Uh, against the suits is what we call it. You say, why is it called against the suits? Because there's a lot of people in Las Vegas that wear suits every single day to work and they work in casinos and they work for you know different sports books and they take our money. Well, no more. When we bet with against the suits from right here on the hard count, we take back what's ours. We are against the suits taken back what they have taken from us and we're going to slowly but surely just kind of tap away at the base of some of those skyscrapers and before you know it it'll just be a desert for the people because of how we have operated with against the suits this year uh we've been rolling too i'll say that we've been rolling so follow me on instagram to be able to stay up with one the questions and then two the uh the best bets we're going week in and week out so thank you for letting me plug that nick i appreciate Absolutely. that that was a bit yeah. of a hole but uh, we got time for one more. What do you say? We've got time for one more. Um, for, before I do so, I want to shout out Intella. If I got that name wrong, please comment and correct me. Uh, Gavin had another good one. John Paul Bacon had a good one. Um, a lot of people had good questions we're not going to get to today. Like I said, if you can, get to the Instagram page. If not, come back on Tuesday. We've got three more shows next week. But Let's I'm going to go with Jesse Adams' question because he asked it a lot. J.D., you're going to have to help me with a name pronunciation here. Sure. Uh, it says, J.D., do you think this Michigan manifesto by Connor is just him channel- or channeling his inner Ted Kaczynski? Is that his name? Is that how you say that? That sounds right. Kaczynski, who's another Michigan alum. You know what, I'm, you know what he's talking about? Man, so the, there, the there's manifesto? probably more there. I mean, I, I saw that question, and I kind of wanted to take another direction because there was the Michigan manifesto about Connor Stallion, you know— having this expansive plan to one day lead Michigan. And it was like, I think five, 600 pages. Absolutely wild. Get in the live chat and let me know the 30 for 30 title of the Connor Salian story when that becomes a reality. Cause I feel like it's just a matter of time before we get a documentary on this. Um, My thought on this, the manifesto was just one, like Hilarious is the wrong word, but it's like hilarious in the sense that it's so college football because this is so crazy that this is happening right now. Like only in college football do we get a story like this. Um, I've got some theories on how all this information came to be, and I can't prove any of it. So it's all just a conspiracy theory. But Nick, doesn't it feel just a little bit like this was a lot of information that became available in a very short period of time at a very weird time? And so in my mind, again, conspiracy theory, can't prove it. We're speculating wildly. End of the show. We're having a good time. So take this with like not just a grain of salt, but like a whole like moving truck of salt. Two things in my mind became thoughts when I heard about this whole Michigan story. One, okay, so it was maybe a staffer on the field that saw somebody in the stands that said, hey, that seems weird told somebody that lined up with their suspicions of like Michigan being ahead of their game plan, which then they pulled on that string and unraveled this whole thing. That doesn't check out because I don't think you just find one person in the stands and then think that's stealing your signals. And then you tug on that. And that makes this whole thing like come to life. Like that feels like a little bit of a stretch to me. It feels like to me, there was some, something going on internally at Michigan. And we know there's mixed opinions on Jim Harbaugh at Michigan and they said, you know what? Let's turn this whole thing over. I don't know if that's true. That's the way that it feels to me. I have no information. I have no insight. I am like giving the biggest disclaimer possible, but I'll say this. It feels a lot like an inside job with all the information coming to light in the fashion that it is. Cause I think the whole, somebody saw this in the stands and, and reported it like, come on now. Like we really, if it happened it happened. but like, that's, that feels like a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a stretch to me. I don't know that we just pull on that thread. And, uh, and it happens. Also, Connor Stallion, I don't think from the report, like it wasn't him showing up, showing up at every game. So it wasn't like you saw him at one stadium one year, you saw him the next year, the same guy. Like maybe it happened that way, but more likely it was different people showing up at different stadiums. And you would think like that, that wouldn't probably set off any alarms within the, uh, you know, cause for concern. So that's a lot of thoughts, Nick. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like that seems crazy to me, but I, I just gave a complete conspiracy theory on this show. So maybe there's, you know, Maybe there's some other conspiracy theories coming our way from the chat, but um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Is, is my uh, there's this scene in Pulp Fiction where uh, uh, the John Travolta and Samuel Jackson are driving this guy in the back of the car, and they ask him what he thinks, and he says, "Man, I don't even have an opinion," and that's how I feel. I love it. That's how I, I love feel. it. Well, man, what do you say we uh, put a cherry on top of this thing, and, and we'll uh, we'll get out of here? But hey, man, congrats on the big win. More big kickball coming up next week. 
Yeah. Uh, you're a legend. <laughs> Likewise, JD. Hey, shout out to everyone in the chat. I think mm. we've got a really good community in there. Yeah, um, man. A lot of, lot of lifers in here. So we appreciate y'all yeah. being dialed in. Appreciate y'all making this, making this what it is. Yeah. Nick, you're the man. Uh, we'll get after it Sunday, brother. Yeah, well, I'll see you bright and early Sunday morning. Let's man. get it. For those of y'all that don't know, no live show on Sunday, but we do a ton of content in one-off video form on this channel. We call it the Sunday Sprint because we are sprinting to get the content out to y'all as soon as you wake up so you have something to talk about or something to, to digest, rather, uh, when it comes to our thoughts on the Saturday that was in college football. Again, can't say it enough. Thank you for being dialed in. Thank you for the way that y'all are crushing it on the prize picks front. Again, code JD, 100% deposit match up to 100 bucks. Get in on that. They're taking care of us. And, uh, and that way, we're taking care of everybody. Buying some Christmas presents early for the kids. Uh, make sure to subscribe before we get out of here. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all. I'm JD Piquel. We're going to keep this party rolling. We will see y'all next time.